In this video, we're going to take a quick look at best practices using Project Lombok with Spring Boot. So Project Lombok is a library that you can use. It uses annotation processing to hook into the compile process, and it will generate source code prior to compilation. So it saves you from writing a lot of ceremonial and boilerplate type code. It's a, a real time saver. And the way it does it, you need to understand it does hook into the compilation process. It actually generates actual source code so it gets compiled down to bytecode. It's very efficient to do it that way because it's not going to be running at runtime to modify anything. It's not using reflection. It's not going to slow anything down. It's actual source code that gets compiled. It, it is very efficient to use. Arguably, it has a few milliseconds to your compile process. It's not very much overhead in compiling it, but it is pretty efficient at runtime because it is native Java code that's running. You're not using reflection. Reflection can be expensive and heavy to, to utilize in a Java program. So this is uh, very, very efficient to utilize. And when it comes to using Spring, there's a few things that Project Lombok is really handy for. You annotate your classes. You can add the SLF4J annotation to any of your Spring classes, and it will bring in a, a logger for it. And Spring Boot does support several different loggers out there. I do recommend sticking to SLF4J. So that is, uh, if I remember right, it's simple logging facade over for Java. So it's a, a facade that matches all the, the more popular logging libraries out there. So by default, Spring Boot uses logback, but if you want to switch over to a different library, you can do so without changing your source code as long as you're staying on SLF4J. Your source code doesn't change. You can change the logging implementation. It's completely transparent if you want to do that. So I, I do recommend staying with the SLF4J. And then the data annotation, this is a very handy annotation, especially for POJOs. This will automatically generate your getters, your setters, a two string equals and hash code. These are all methods that will automatically get uh, implemented when you use the data on POJOs. I do want to say use this with caution on entities, especially on entities where you have a bi directional uh, relationship. So you have a, a class that points to another class and the, that class points back to it as a, with a reference. What happens when you use the two string and equals and hash code methods, you get in an endless loop because one's pointing to one, the other's pointing to the other, and Lombok is unable to break out of that loop and it will cause you uh, problems. So don't do that on entities with bi-directional relationships, but um, for simple POJOs, it works great. The builder, I, I like the builder functionality when you have builder methodology on POJOs. Very nice, fluent way to create new objects. It is handy. But I, I remember when the builder pattern started becoming pan, uh, popular, it was nice to use, but it was very time-consuming to add and maintain. Project Lombok will automatically generate uh, builders for your, your POJOs and entities. It's very nice to use. It does, if you start getting into more complex uh, inheritance and polymorphism and things like that, uh, the builder can get a little confused. It it can be done. It takes a little tweaking sometimes. So, but if you have simple, simple single level pojos, or even if there's uh, nested objects, works fine for that. It's when it's, you start getting into inheritance, the the builder doesn't always work properly. With Spring, I think it was in Spring 3.2. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I'm going from memory. For classes with a single constructor that Spring was able to figure out the arguments for, you do not need to add the auto-wired annotation. So for dependency injection, I like to use the acquired args constructor. Works out very well. I just add in a, a new property and make it final. That makes it required, and that automatically adds it to the constructor. And then at runtime, Spring Boot will pick that up, or Spring Framework will pick that up and do dependency injection for you. And then on more complex projects, where you're doing a lot of type conversions, I do like to combine Lomb Lombok with MapStruck to manage the type conversions. MapStruck works nicely with Lombok if you define builders for the, the types. Uh, MapStruck will automatically utilize the builders over getters and setters. So that's a, a nice little feature, kind of a hidden feature that works out well. Next in the video, we're going to go in. I've got a Spring Boot project set up, and we'll take a look at examples of all these. Okay, on the screen I have a, a Spring Boot project. 
If you've taken my uh, Spring 6 course on Udemy, this probably looks familiar with yet. I did uh, steal a lot of the code from it. It's not an exact match of what's inside of the course, but fairly similar. So it's a basic Rust application that sets up a couple controllers, uh, entities, details for mapping between them. It uses map struct to map between them. I'm just going to use this as a reference to show some examples of Project Lombok. So here with the beer controller, right now we've got a private final beer service. So that is get, getting dependency injected. And I have to declare a constructor for that by convention. And now Spring will pick that up and dependency inject that. Just from experience, controllers aren't too bad, but you start getting into the service layer, you'll start having multiple dependencies injected. So every time you have to inject a new dependency, you need to modify the controller. Lombok makes that a lot easier. And all we can do is come up here and say required args constructor like so. And you can see that IntelliJ is not happy about that. But now I can just remove that constructor like so. And that cleans up our code a little bit. And what I like about this again, if as you're evolving your code, if you need to have another dependency come in, you just declare the property and Lombok at compile time will provide the constructor. So it works out really nice for as you're developing and going on. And then on line 26, you can see I'm bringing in SLF4J logger and I'm doing a static final to that. For me, I always forget what that syntax is for the logger. For life of me, I can't remember it. I can remember the simple annotation, like so, bring in that. And now this goes away and Lombok will enhance the class. And just from a visual standpoint of the code, I, I believe this is a, a little bit cleaner implementation. The code's cleaner. You don't have a constructor there to worry about. It's just ceremonial code that Lombok is getting rid of. Talking about ceremonial code, let's take a look at this object here, the beer TTO. In the old days, if you're going to be writing a, a traditional Java Pojo, you're going to create a, a constructor for it. I might want to have a couple different constructors for it. Here, I'm declaring a builder pattern. These are all the properties of the POJO. What's that, about seven or eight properties? I'm just kind of winging it there. Now, to implement all the getters and setters, we're implementing all these getters and setters. And then we have the equals hash code to string. And then we get into the class. Again, I said in the introduction of the bit video, I like using builders. When you're creating objects, builders are, are really nice. They're very efficient to use. And it's also a good practice. It does help with your code quality as far as having the, the builder, especially in multi-threaded environments. It, it is safer to use the builder to declare your objects. It also leads to a lot of code generation. I can reduce this class. Let's get rid of a lot of this builder code. So I'm going to completely delete that. And we can get rid of the equals hash code and two string. Then we have all these getters and setters. We'll wipe those out as well. And we're just cleaning up the code here a little bit. Now we don't need the builder. Get rid of that. We also don't need the constructor. And to get back to the equivalent of this, I can come in and say, Builder, I'll do it. And I can do a all args constructor, also no args constructor like that. So now I'm using different project Lombok annotations. The data annotation, that is actually consolidated. I think if I click into that, we can actually see this actually will implement. There's also other. Uh, Lombok annotations and got getter setter uh, required args constructor two string equals hash code and a value method as well so it actually adds a, another option there so I actually don't need the required args constructor because the data annotation brings that in all args and required args have different functionality but now we can see I forget how many lines we originally had in this class but you can see your POJO implementation is much cleaner. We just have a couple of annotations at the top of the class, and we get all that functionality. The data gives us the two string equals getters, setters. 
the builder implements the uh, builder pattern, and then we have the constructors. You might want to create the class on the fly, fly with no arguments or provide all arguments. And then data is also going to be required arguments. So if any of these properties were final, that would be included in the, the required. Now let's take a look at the beer service. This is an example of where I've declared multiple dependencies. So I am using the required args constructor. Part of my conversion, I don't need an application publisher anymore. But this is my service implementation. And you can see here, this required args constructor, what that is going to do, it's going to create a constructor for the beer repository, the beer map, or in the cache manager. These are all things that will automatically be injected into the class through a constructor. And if I evolve this class some more, all I have to do is declare the, the property for the dependency I want to inject and make it final, and Lombok will automatically update the constructor for me. Now, when it comes to working with lines itself, let's come here and take a look at our entities. We have beer order, and in this, it's got a relationship to beer order line. This is a one-to-many relationship to beer order lines, and now we, if we come back to order line, this has an inverse relationship to beer order. On this, I'm using getters and setters. I'm not using the data method because data is going to bring in the, the two string uh, equals and hash code. And with that bi bi-directional relationship, it is not happy at all. So you don't want to do that in entities with bi-directional relationships because you get into an endless loop because one entity is trying to generate equals and hash code and two string for the child entity, and the child entity is pointing back to the parent entity, and it wants to continue that on, and, and Lombok just gets in an endless loop. Very bad to do <laughs> when you do it that way, and this is something I learned the hard way. When you do have bi-directional relationships like that, do not use the data annotation, but favor using getter and setter. Or if you want to use data, you can exclude those properties from the data annotation. Now, one last thing I want to show you, I do have a uh, map struct implemented. Map struct is for moving between entities and details, very common practice for moving between common types like that and creating mappers for it. It is an absolute uh, lifesaver in terms of time and functionality. Here is the beer mapper. This is going to take a beer entity and map it to the beer DTO and vice versa. It'll take the DTO and map it back to the entity. So we can take a look at the implementation. This is going to be generated, so very similar to Lombok. The, the trick here is it is a, also an annotation processor, and it does require a little bit of configuration here. This here, I'll have a link to GitHub uh, if you want to see this. For the compiler, for the map struct and project Lombok to work together, you do need to set up the Apache Maven compiler with the map struct processor, project Lombok, and also from Project Lombok, the MapStruct binding. Uh, this has been at stable 020 for quite some time, so it's stable, it works well. And then for the argument to get the MapStruct components automatically injected into your class, add this compiler argument, the default component model to spring. And then when we come to the target and take a look to see what was generated. So here's our, our beer mapper implementation that compiler flag, that's what's going to add in this component. So this will get picked up as a spring component. And now I have a mapper implementation. And also you can see the implementation because on the DTOs, you can see I, I did declare builders. MapStruck automatically is going to uh, utilize the builder over getters and setter. So I think that's a, a nice little, little feature of using Project Lombok and MapStruck together. Now I hope you find this video useful. I'm a big fan of Lombok. It does a true time saver as well as using a map struck with it. They both save a lot of time. This video does not show all the features of Lombok nor map struck. It's just some best practices that I've found using Lombok for several years with Spring Framework. There's a couple of gotchas with it. And there's additional features inside of Lombok that, that are time savers as well. Didn't go into them here. Uh, Lombok is uh, much a much larger, much robust project, but if you Google Project Lombok, you'll find their homepage and see all the features and functionality of it.